Welcome. <laughs> Welcome neighbors and friends to the Woodbury Community Room. And this event titled Retta's Journey to Health, um, presented by Woodbury resident Retta Dunlap. Um, how fortunate we are to be together and to be able to come to this space and share ideas and information and ideas and stories. And um, we want to thank the following organizations for, um, or folks for helping to promote this event and put it together. The Woodbury Community Library Director, Mirna, the Library Board of Trustees, the Hardwood Community Television, um, an introduction of our featured speech, speaker. Uh, in 1977, Retta moved to Woodbury and after her marriage to Wayne Dunlap. She raised four children here and homeschooled them. Um, she served in many town community committees, including the school board. Um, once the kids were grown and moved out of the house, she went back to school at Johnson State and got her degree in poli sci. Um, currently, she's working from home as a computer trainer and a technical writer for business management development companies. Um, and she's now focusing on her health, and that's why we're here tonight. Um, she's accomplished a lifestyle change and turned her health around, and we're all really curious to hear about how that happened. Um, after Retta's presentation, she'll welcome questions and comments, and then you can help yourself to some refreshments. So over to Retta. Thank you, Retta, for coming. <laughs> Need a little paper here because I couldn't get my iPad to talk to my PC. But anyway, um, I also over there on the table is an eggplant curry. So I'm not demoing food, but there is an eggplant curry. I tried it on my family and they like it, and I like it. It's made with no salt, oil, or added sugar. And uh, I would like you to try it, and I want to hear how you feel about it. Um, people have different genetic backgrounds, different uh, personalities, and different health journeys that they go on. And this one is simply my story. It's my perceptions, my understanding of the science, and, and how and why I, I did it. Um, there's no shame or judgment in this at all either, because last November 1st, I weighed 235 pounds. And so I've, I've you know, I, I could see myself being dead by 70. And now I can see myself living to 100 just by the turnaround that I've made. So here's my story. Let's see if this works. Done. All right. So around um, uh, 2018, I was vegging on the couch as I typically did. And I was at Netflix one, looking for something to watch. This was an hour long documentary on the science of fasting. And the first 15 minutes changed my life. In Russia, there is or was apparently a water-only fasting clinic. And during the time of the USSR, health care covered uh, the, the cost of going to this clinic for people to reverse their diabetes, their high blood pressure, and their high cholesterol. That was all I needed to hear. OK, all right, you sold me. And does this really work? Um, they, it, it, it's in Siberia. It's by a lake. And I'm getting out Google, finding out where it is, and I'll need a visa, I'll need a passport. How much will, will they really let me go and do this? I mean, do countries let, you know? So, so I was like, and then I'm going, no, wait a minute. There's got to be one here in the US. So I got out Google again, and well, yes, there is. I found the Trier Health Center in Santa Rosa, California. Um, I went to talk to my primary care physician, Dr. John Matthew at the Plainfield Health Center, and I you know, said, this is what I want to do, and I've done all this research, and here's the websites, you can do some research too. And he said, oh no, I'm fine with it, but I'll take it, I'll go look at it. And he did, he went, he told me, oh no, I checked them out. Um, so so that's, that's how I, I came to find True North. Now when I got home, I went and had my blood drawn at the, the Plainfield Health Center, and then I went and had a visit with Dr. Matthew. And um, my, my numbers, oops, my total cholesterol went from 256 to 167, and that's in the seven weeks. And my triglycerides went from 379 to 95. And all, I don't know how many of you know Dr. Matthew, but he had said several times during the visit, I'm impressed. 
I don't know, I'm impressed, you know. So, so that, that's impressive for Dr. Matthew, who is, is, is really, really, really good doctor. Anyway, the center was co-founded by Dr. Alan Goldhammer and his wife, Dr. Jennifer Moreno, back in 1984. They have also have a True North Health Foundation that does fundraising and research and, and has, some, they have some website, has clinical studies in it. They have a current capacity in that uh, facility of about 70 fasting patients at any one time, and they've run 21,000 people through that center in the past 40 years, of which I am now one. Um, and it is the largest facility in the world that does water-only fasting and research on it. So no wonder I was looking for Russia and only found one here. Um, and so that was pretty cool. All right, so my early life. People often talk about, you know, just push away from the table and use your willpower. That four-year-old right there um, was enrolled in kindergarten. And every time the teacher said, it's time to roll out your mats and, and take a little nap, I'd get on the floor, watch that teacher. And as soon as she wasn't looking, I left. And I walked home. I did this several times. Drove them crazy. Because I'm, I'm too busy to take a nap. you got to be kidding me. So I have willpower. Um, I, grew, I, I grew up in a family. Uh, uh, my mother, when she married my father, at the age of 27, she weighed 109 pounds. I grew up thin. Um, I was also very active. This picture of me lying on a rock, that's Burnt Rock Mountain here in, here in Vermont. That happened to be a 15-mile overnight hike over Camel's Hump, Burnt Rock, and some other mountain's name I can't remember. Um, so, you know, when I was a teenager, there was a lot of hiking. And the picture up here, you know, I'm in the blue coat, Beth Neal is in the red coat. She's the postmistress here in town that, that passed a few years back. She's five months pregnant, and I'm six months pregnant, and we're on top of Camel's Hump. <laughs> so, so willpower and being active is not my problem. But this mom right here, picture of me with my four kids, we always seem to harvest vegetables in the dark. And if you see the carrots are rather large, they're nice large organic carrots. That woman there was having trouble with her weight, struggling to keep, you know, with the busy life. And I believe I was a stress eater then. Get stressed, I eat, it made me feel better, and that was pretty cool. And um, so, so that's where it began. All the years, I kept gaining weight. And I kept saying to doctors, why? Why am I gaining weight? I, you know, willpower, exercise, OK, got it. But I said, something inside my body changed during those years of raising kids. And life is stressful, but not everyone who drinks alcohol becomes an alcoholic. And, but I was having trouble with food, and I was trying to hide it. So I ended up spending life from sitting in a chair, participating with the kids. Except for this little picture up here in the upper um, left right-hand corner. Um, the, in, in Acadia National Park up in Maine, there's a hike called the Precipice. And it's a rock face that just goes up like this. And somebody, at some point in time, made a, a trail up there with steps and things to hold on to. And the kids were going to climb it. And I said, oh, I'm coming with you. And so I did climb it, but I had to take breaks, about 10 of them, to get up there. And that's me lying on a rock, resting again. So that's just my MO hiking. If I'm tired, I lie down. Um, a few years later, down to October 2019, uh, my mom wanted to go to Church on the Mountain. So the Loon Mountain Ski Resort has a church up there. You can see the. Uh, it's really a beautiful place to be. Um, she moved in with me, and she was sick, and she was dying. She had progressive supranuclear palsy. And eventually, she would not be able to swallow anything, fluid or food. And um, so she also, about the time she moved in with me, was placed on hospice with a DNR and, and the whole nine yards. And she died in May of 2020. And this is all in the middle of COVID. And we also cared for her body. The, the hospice nurse and I washed her and dressed her. James had built her a coffin. She was in my house for 48 hours after her death for family to come and say goodbye. And within, and th that's important to know because within three months, my A1C, and that's the three month average of the glucose in your blood, it went from something like 5.9 to 17.3. I was now diabetic. And 
I'm sitting in the health center, they want to give me insulin, and, and of course I had researched it before I got there. I said, no, I'm not taking insulin. I have plenty of insulin, I don't need any more. But if I cause this in three months, I can uncause it in three months. That little willful four-year-old again. So three months later, sure enough, I'd gotten it back down to 7.2, but I was now on diabetic medication. And all the while, I'm remembering about I found True North. And because of my mother's death, she left me a little bit of money, and that's what funded my seven-week visit at True North. And this woman here, I went back to Church on the Mountain, this time with my, other, my daughter Elizabeth and little, my granddaughter Raya. And this woman in the red hat here knows what these two women kept asking doctors for. Why can't I control this? And I now know, and I learned it in this book. It's called The Pleasure Trap, written by Dr. Goldhammer and a friend of his, Dr. Lug D Douglas Lyle, who is an evolutionary psychologist. So they have an interesting take on what, what the, the problem is that I was having. And of course, the byline is mastering the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. And that hidden force is added salt, oil, and sugar to my food. I cannot have salt and oil and sugar added to my food. It tastes too good, and I will overeat. And what it, um, it causes is a dopamine hit. Anytime you eat anything, you're going to have a dopamine hit, because it's, it, it's what the body does, because the body wants to ensure that you eat to survive. And um, so I guess a dopamine is my drug of choice, and I became an addict, and you put salt, oil, and sugar in it, and I'll eat dinner four times. So, I, and that, that anyway. Um, now, the evolutionary part of it that Dr. Lyle talks about is that we evolved in a, a society of scarcity, and now we live in one of abundance. And, you know, whether you believe you're made that way or created that way, it's still the same. We, we now can process food so that it has far too many chemicals in them. And even salt, oil, and sugar are, they're not whole foods, they are fractured. The, the salt, mining salt used to be really hard, I guess it's really easy now. But, um, I have it twice on there. So, so anyway, so that, that's where I found myself. I'm in grocery stores, you've got 17 aisles of bags, boxes, and cans, and one aisle of produce. It might be a double wide aisle, but, it's far from the whole food, and, and this is the environment I now live in and can't really um, deal with it. So the healthy lifestyle that uh, the, um, the center uh, encourages after you leave the center, and, and while you're there, you get lectures and training, and you get all kinds of support. But uh, you eat a whole plant whole food plant-based diet that's SOS free, that's salt, oil, and sugar free, get plenty of sleep, plenty of exercise, and do some intermittent fasting and occasionally some extended fasting. And for someone like me, I would probably do a 10-day water fast every year, um, if possible. And other things to reduce stress, live in gratitude, you know, have connections with family and friends makes life healthy. So this is what the SOS free uh, means. Um, these are my five food groups, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, and nuts and seeds. That's what I eat now. I don't eat processed foods, even vegan processed foods. They're just not good for you. I mean, look at the chemical list in them. Um, so I don't eat any processed foods or minimally processed. I mean, I do drink soy milk, and that is a processed food, but it's, you know, it's, it's not as bad as other things I could be eating. I don't eat animal products. I don't caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, um, recreational drugs, which I never really did to begin with, and avoiding toxins. Um, this is Chef AJ. She's someone. She's been a vegan for like ever, and she has trouble with her weight. And she now has. She helps other people. She's a coach. She helps people, you know, to, to lose weight. And she came up with this chart. So I try to eat to the left of the red line, which are those four, four food groups that. I just showed you, except for nuts and seeds. Nuts and seeds and avocados are purple. So if you're losing weight, you kind of want to stay away from those until you're at weight. And you can just eat as much as you want. And caloric density is, is the key. So if you imagine a cup of rice, just plain brown rice, and then another cup of rice um, with the salt, oil, and sugar, I'll eat three times as much. Or what about oil? What if I put oil into that rice? Um, 4,000 calories a pound for oil. If I eat a pound of oil, I would need 200 pounds of lettuce to match it. 
So um, it's caloric density. I need to eat the lower caloric, the, the lower caloric dense food, and I can eat a lot of food. I can feel full. So I can fill my stomach. If I get to the end of the day from eating steamed vegetables and salads and I'm still hungry, I get a couple of tomato, uh, potatoes, and that puts weight into my stomach and I'm feeling satisfied. And it, it, it's really a hard concept to get used to when you're used to measuring, and oh, I can't have this, and I have to have a little of that and a little of this, to I can eat all I want now from that particular, you know, to the left of the red line. And I can be full and satisfied and it tastes good, and I can get to that in a minute, of, of why food tastes pretty good to me now, even though there's no salt oil and sugar in it. So when I was fasting, yes, you feel hungry every day. It's not like you're going to go, well, for me, it wasn't like I was going to go crazy, um, but I just drank some water, and the feeling went away. You get fasting brain. You can't think. Words don't come quickly. I mean, you, you don't sleep. I got three to four hours of sleep a night and there's nothing you can do about it because your brain is screaming, you're not eating, you're going to die, better get some food, no, I'm not going to let you sleep. That makes it hard to concentrate. Um, the mind's reaction to the lack of food, you know, I, that was the part I, I wish I had known more about how the mind reacted to the fasting process because it's like unhinged and that um, I'm in a control person, control freak maybe. Um, my electrolytes did fall, fall uh, the potassium fell down to almost to the level where if it drops one more point, fasting's over. And so we tried broth, and this is broth that's made by the kitchen at True North. Out of the, ta out of the food scraps, because that's all they cook there, are the vegetable scraps, so they make broth out of it. The, the broth does not break ketosis, it does not break the fast, there are no calories in it but there are electrolytes, and it brought mine up sufficiently so that I could finish the water fast. But I was generally miserable. And I want to mention that fasting is not starvation. Um, starvation happens when your body starts to eat your muscles, and then you've got problems, because the heart's a muscle, too. So during my 28 days of fasting, um, the very first one is that I switched energy sources, and this is why fasting is not starvation. Day one, you're going to burn through the glucose in your blood. Day two, you're going to burn through the glycogen, glycogen in your liver, which it turns into glucose. And then day three, the body's going to go, oh, there's some more gly glycogen in those muscles. I'm going to go get that. And then the body goes, wait a minute. If I do that, you won't be strong enough to get food. So then, about three days in, the body switches to burning fat and it turns into ketones. So the body is no longer really running on glucose, but running on ketones. And so your body switches energy sources. And the, the, the fat that the body uh, goes after is the visceral fat, the fat that's around your organs. And, and it preferentially goes for that. And then once that's taken care of, because that's the deadly kind of fat that covers your organs. Once it cleans that up, it goes for other things. Let's see, I detoxed big time. That's where the miserable part comes in. I performed, my body performed autophagy, which simply means self-eating. The body goes around and it cleans itself up. Broken cells, dying cells, dead cells, it, it, it breaks them up. It recycles what it can and gets rid of what it doesn't need. The entire system gets rebooted during an extended water fast and it resets the palate. That's why just plain steamed broccoli tastes really great for me. Um, a piece of lettuce I've, has so much flavor. I had no idea because the frequency of my, my, my palate was up here. I needed so much salt, milk, and sugar just to have the food taste good that when you bring that back down, you get to taste the natural flavors of our food. And we miss that in processed foods. It also broke my addiction to salt, oil, and sugar. It also breaks the addiction to caffeine. It breaks the addiction to nicotine. And it can also break addictions to other alcohol and drugs. Um, it reversed my inflammation, which has not returned. I don't know if you, remember, if you really remember me in town meeting being so miserable just walking up to the microphone. and I was just miserable, you know, because I, my muscles hurt, I'm fatigued. During this fasting process, my body healed whatever was going on in my body. I have no more muscle pain and I have no more muscle fatigue of any kind. Of course, it reversed my chronic diseases. It healed my body. and. Although I won't ever do this again, but if I got to the place where I was sick again, I would absolutely do it. 
So Dr. Goldhammer says fasting can speed up the process in days instead of weeks and months of effort. And that's why I fasted, because it was fast tracking the, the healthy change that I wanted to make. After a fast, uh, the rule of thumb is, is that however long you fast, you have to refeed for half of that. So I fasted for 28 days, 14 days I had to refeed. And you start out with juice. So I did three days of juice. This is a picture of their juices. There's, there's a red one that's missing, which is a watermelon one. So I think the green one is like zucchini and carrot, uh, cucumber. And then the other red orange one is carrot. And then there's one that's watermelon. So three days of juice. And then I got to do three days of raw. And that's like basically a salad. So I remember sitting in the dining hall. And this is where I, I took this piece of romaine lettuce. And I put it in my mouth. And I'm chewing on it. And I'm <laughs> I'm sitting there and saying out loud, oh my god, this has flavor. <laughs> because I, before, before True North, I didn't really care for lettuce. It was just like something you had to have in, you know, in the salad. But, but it, was, I was, it just blew my mind, the flavor that came through from that first bite of food. Three days of steam, three days of grain, and then you're unrestricted, which means you can add your legumes and you're, you're back to normal. But refeeding can actually be a deadly time if you don't do it right. And I had fasted for a long time, so you know it, you really have to do that right. Uh, Dr. Goldhammer says to undo dietary excess damage, adopt a health-promoting diet exclusive of whole plant foods, SOS-free diet. Get enough sleep and exercise, and if you do this long enough and well enough, the body is remarkably forgiving. This guy thinks I can live to be 111. <laughs> Maybe he's right. He is, I think, a year older than I am. We both have birthdays. I think his is in October as well as mine. So, so I don't know. Maybe when I'm 111, I'll knock on his door. But um, <laughs> so um, this slide is just a little bit of a play. This is the director, the doctor, and the chef. You know, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Um, uh, Dr. Goldhammer here. I remember uh, he does lectures every Monday afternoon, and I, as a patient, have a login, and I can go. I've listened to all three of them do their lectures multiple times, even the same topics. It's just it, it just helps me to stay on track. Um, in one of his his lectures, uh, I was sitting there. I purposely sat next to the window and the wall so I could lean on it. And I was like, I was just miserable holding my arms. They were hurting and everything. And I forget what, how the exchange started. I asked a question or something. And I looked at him and I said, I'm absolutely miserable and I'm never, ever doing this again. And he gets this big grin on his face. And I said, I am so glad I'm providing you with, with uh, fun here. <laughs> and he says, because you feel so miserable is why you're here and I'm glad you're here. So, so it was like, he has a, a dry sense of humor. And I would just wonder, every, there, there's a courtyard, and you're going to see pictures of it in a minute. And the courtyard has chairs and cushions, and the patients during the day move them around and switch the cushions, and nothing is, it's like a, it's just a mess at night. In the morning, somebody has gone through and put it back together. Well, two or three mornings, I caught, doctor, uh, caught, I saw out my window, Dr. Goldhammer is apparently one of those that goes through and rearranges the furniture for us, which is, is pretty nice because fasting is supposed to be in a complete uh, state of rest. So, um, so, so yeah, he, he's the brainchild of this place, and that kitchen, the chef in the kitchen in that dining room serves exactly what he wants us to have. I think coming home, I have a little more latitude, and of course he doesn't live in my kitchen, therefore I can do what I want anyway. <laughs> so, but, but I do try to follow this because I feel so good and I don't want to go back. The guy in the middle is Dr. Anthony Strucker, MD. He has admitting privileges at the hospital, should True North need them. Um, but uh, this picture cracks me up. See, I didn't take these pictures. A friend of mine that I met at True North, Christina, did, and you're going to meet her a little, little later on here. I asked her to go and take these pictures so I could use them in my slide. And I said, like, you know, Dr. Strucker, when he does his rounds, he's dressed like a doctor, nice and crisp and everything. I said, can you get one of those? Well, this is what I got, that grin on his face. I'm sure he messed up his hair. But, but he's my attending physician. So he, all the information that was gathered, I had twice a day I had a medical assistant take my blood pressure and my glucose. And then twice a day I saw a, a, a doc, rounding doctors, they call them. Um, they came in and asked a, a list of questions, which would, you would think they were odd questions. I can't remember what they were. 
but from 40 years of fasting people, they know exactly what to ask for, they know exactly what they're looking for. And of course, they, they also did a, a one minute heart rate on me, I think to make sure I wasn't skipping too many beats. And all this information funnels up to Dr. Strucker. Um, he, uh, what was he here? Oh, he, when I first got there, he gave me his cell phone number. So I'm like, wow, the doctor giving you his cell phone number. You need any questions, you, 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 you call me. Even Dr. Goldhammer, he eats in the dining room. Well, he eats there three meals a day, I think, something like that. But he, he eats in the dining room just so he can be with patients. So my point is that these guys are accessible to the patients there. Um, so anyway, that, that was pretty cool. That he's, he kept me alive. So the last one here, this is Dr. Rand Doctor. This is Chef Francis Bravo, the executive chef. Now he is a chef in out in uh, a classical chef, a chef that cooks meat. He knows how to do that. He re he's run restaurants before. Fifteen years ago, he came to work at the health set at the True North Center here, and he basically revamped their 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 menu. He has two cookbooks which are over there. If you guys want to look at his cookbooks, um, and he does demos and lectures. And one of his lectures was how to eat in a restaurant. And he says, let me explain to you what the back of the kitchen looks like and what they're doing and, and what they expect of you as, as guests in a restaurant. And if you order something different, you mess up the kitchen. You'll make the chef mad. So here's what you do. The day before, call between 2 and 4 to the restaurant and tell them, I have a special diet, I can eat this and I can't have that, can you make something for me because our family's coming tomorrow, we're all, you know, and you'll find out whether they can or they don't. Well, uh, Wayne took me out to dinner to Michael's on the Hill in Waterbury, over next to Stowe, for our 45th wedding anniversary, a few weeks ago, and I did this. I called, and my, Michael is a chef. He's a, a, a from Switzerland. He's been there about 20 years. Wayne actually inspected the building. That's how come Wayne knew there was a restaurant there. And and they, oh yeah, no problem. Yep, yeah, yes, it was free. Yep, yeah, we got this. And I got there, and I had my salad, and then my entree, which is what the chefs prepared special for me. It like had a a, a, a squash sauce in the bottom and some lettuce and this beautiful tomato turned into a flower and, and, and an, a red onion ring that's only burned on the rim. I have to figure out how that's done. It was absolutely delicious and I had a plate of food. Wayne had beef tenderloin and crushed french fries and ketchup. And, um, it was, this is a higher class kind of restaurant so I didn't dare take a selfie. I, but I wish I had the, the waiter take a picture. It was our 45th anniversary. We could have a picture. Anyway, I'm looking at this going, oh my goodness, this is that nursery rhyme from 1639. Let me see. Jack Spratt could eat no fat. His wife could eat, eat no lean. And between the both of them, you see, they lick the platter clean. And I'm like going, boom, we got that. So, so anyway, I was able to go out and have a lovely evening and have a nice meal. Oh, one other thing the chef does, which I particularly like, is when, in, when he does his demos, yes, he has recipes, but he says, no, I'm not going to tell you what the recipe is. Learn the theory. Learn how to cook. So when you open your refrigerator, you can make something to eat. Because with, with this way of cooking, it's, I'm always shopping. I'm always prepping. I need to do more batch prepping, and I'm always cooking. And so it takes up more time to do this. But when you batch prep, 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 or you can open the fridge and just grab ten, five things and make something to eat. It makes doing it so much easier. Now these are the unsung heroes of True North. That's Chef Mauricio, I believe the sous chef. Between the two of the Chef Bravo and, and Chef Mauricio, they, they run the kitchen. Um, the woman in the middle, I don't remember her name, but I'm pretty sure she does dishes. All of them, thank God bless her. And then Augie here and Sarah. Augie runs the cleaning staff. And because at this, I don't, I don't have to cook, I don't have to do dishes, I don't have to clean, I don't have to do my own laundry. They even did that. Um, and so one day, I was feeling particularly miserable. I went to my room, I was kind of curled up on the bed, and I'm trying to sleep, and I'm kind of half asleep. Now, the cleaning crew comes in, they all speak Spanish, so it's really fun to listen to them talk in those romance languages. It's just musical, you know. And um, they're, they're always happy and always chattering, so I always love to listen to them clean. I can't understand a word of it, but I, I, I like hearing it. So this particular one time they were out there, they'll knock on the door and check to see if you're in there because they need to come in and clean or do you need anything. And this woman, she, she, and I'm not sure it's this woman, I don't know who it was, my eyes were closed. She poked her head in and she started to say something and she saw that I was asleep. 
or what I was trying to sleep. And she quietly closed the door and she went, shh. <laughs> and everybody stopped talking. They finished cleaning in silence and left. And I'm going, you know, that's love. That's really cared for. And I really appreciated that. So I wanted them included in my, my presentation. Other staff that, oh, over there, that's uh, uh, Kathy Fisher. Her book, her cookbook is here too. She, she's a chef and she comes in and she, does, she actually cooks recipes from her book and she talks about how to make them and how to switch out things. The gentleman here at the top, that's Dr. Linsner. He's a chiropractor there and he was one of the rounding doctors. This is Mir at the bottom of the screen. She's one of the medical assistants and this is Michelle. She's the concierge. So anything these other people can't do, she can. Um, the courtyard. Uh, it, the, the facility is like one of those New Orleans kind of deals with a courtyard in the middle. It's a sizable courtyard. So the one with the fountain, if you look, there's yellow lines there. On the left is the dining room. On the right is the kitchen. And you look at the bottom one, this is looking on the other side of the courtyard. The yellow line there, that's my window and that's my door. So I had a, you know, this window out onto the courtyard so that I could look. And of course, that, that flower bed is full of roses. It wasn't quite blooming, or I think it's maybe done blooming at that time for that picture there. The dining hall doubles as the lecture hall. And patients gather in, 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 in and this is, let's see, Katie and Dawn and Jeanette and Mary and I and the chef had just brought us out a bowl of soup because he was trying out a soup he was going to make for a, for a fundraiser he was attending and it, it had carrot ginger soup so it's orange with a leek fennel soup which was white and it looked like yin and yang in the bowl and I'm like how do you do that? Um, so, so anyway uh, I also want to show you if I can make this work what is in the dining hall, and this is a little video, fruit, nuts, raisins, there's ground flax seed, there's cinnamon, and then over here you've got your greens for your salad, that's the stuff that tastes really good. This salad, this is a cold salad that changes out every day, you've got your fruit salad. Um, the patients really like steamed mushrooms, we go through them like candy, some sprouts, um, more vegetables, the white one, the white and green one in the front, that's zucchini, Julian zucchini. Uh, and then we're going to have citrus and, of course, house dressings. They have about 20 or 25 different dressings that they make and they switch them out. And then on this side is the hot bar. Now, I got this at the end of breakfast. So there's oatmeal with raisins and made with apples, uh, juice, plain oatmeal maybe, and Brussels sprouts for breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a soup of the day, which hadn't come out yet because this is breakfast. So that's what the dining hall looks like. And, and my, I, have a, I have a drawer, I have a, a wide fridge, and I have a drawer in it, which I try to mimic the, the, the salad bar with the vegetables I like. So I have about 10 different things where I can just pull things and make a salad quickly. So I do batch, press, batch prep my salads so that I can do that. So the rooms. My uh, th This is an old apartment building, so in my suite there are three bedrooms. And there's a queen with a private bath. There's a full with a shared bath. Now Danielle went out to the center with me. She was there for four days, so we were in this room. And then I was moved to my room, which, is a, which was a twin bed. I, the computer table was absolutely perfect. That's my window out onto the courtyard. And here's the wardrobe. Um, I had no light switch, I had to pull a string. You'll look on top of the wardrobe on the picture over there that, that there was a plant. Danielle and I went and bought a plant because as you know I'm an avid gardener and I didn't want to be without a plant. So I, I, I bought a plant and I actually shipped it home and it's still alive. Um, it, uh, so it just kind of a momentum. Now full kitchen, I mean this is a vintage kitchen. It's not been used in decades but in this kitchen you can have water warm cold, frozen, hot, and if you want carbonated, you have to go to the dining room to get it. <laughs> so that's all that kitchen uh, had. Toward the end where I, where I was eating, sometimes I couldn't eat everything and I would hide it in the fridge just, just because I wanted to eat it later. It has a common area. I like to sit at the table and look out the window and you know, read and write, and there's my glass of water. Um, and I had over my seven weeks 11 sweet mates. 
and Christina's one, and she's the one that took pictures of most of the people in there. Now, she had a violent traumatic brain injury that tore the derma of her brain. That's that thick skin that covers it. And she is a dentist, and she lived for 16 years with a headache. Constant, never stopping headache. And she asked Dr. Goldhammer, she said, can I come and will this help? And he said, I don't know, come and, come, come and fast. Now the center does up to 40 days. If you need more fasting time, you're supposed to go home, rejuvenate, and come back for more. She, she came and she wanted to do 41. And he, they allowed her to do one extra day just to do more than all the men did, you know. Um, mostly like Jesus did, 40. <laughs> okay. And um, so on day 19, she woke up and she's like, something's wrong. What's going on? She had no headache. For five minutes, she was headache-free. It came back, but the next day it was longer and longer. By the end of her 41-day fast, her headache was gone. So the body healed that derma that surgeons said, we can't sew that back together for you. Um, so there are a lot of stories like that. There's another woman, I did not meet her, she came years ago. She had stage four lymphoma, and they wanted to put her on chemo and all kinds of other radiation and whatnot. And, and she said, no, no, I'm going to come here and try this. And she did a 40-day fast. And by the end of the 40-day fast, the lymphoma was no longer palpable. You couldn't feel the, the enlarged nodes. And, and um, she actually finally got a CAT scan out of her oncologist, and they couldn't see it on the, on the, on the films. And so she, um, Dr. Goldhammer said, you stay on this diet, it won't come back. So we're now, she's now six years out, and it's still in remission. Um, and they've done this for like four other lymphoma patients. So there's something going on inside the body that's invoked when you fast, because your, your digestive system goes to sleep, and the body has all this energy to do something else with. And it goes about doing what it does naturally, and that's healing you. So um, some people come, and they just do a 10-day fast every year. Um, I, you know, some, some, people, some people come repeatedly just to lose those extra pounds that they get, which is probably healthier than keeping them and adding them um, on every year. Then you make friends in the courtyard, and it does not matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. There is shared experience here, and it's like instant friendships. So Dawn is, and Arlene, and then Mary is standing. Now Dawn and Arlene, um, I, have, I text with or I talk on the phone or email because I think one of the things that patients at True North like is they want connection to other patients and they want connection to other people who are whole food plant based SOS free. I've found two in Vermont. I know there's a third one but I don't know his name. I found two in Vermont that I intend to make connections with just, just to have someone who knows what I'm talking about and feeling and experiencing. Um, so I have also have an email list of 40 people, and I also once a month uh, 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 set up a Zoom meeting, and we, you know, about 10 or 12 of them, depending on who they are, we get together and we visit, because it, it really helps to keep this going, um, because I've been successful at this, you know, it's, it, it, it's hard, but it's hard for a lot of people, and they struggle with it, and so it's nice to be able to talk to someone who's going through that, and I just found it fascinating to, you know, it, the courtyard, the, 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 the dynamics of the courtyard are kind of interesting. I used to enjoy just watching the dynamics. But you would have groups of men, groups of women, and then they would trade and be men and women. And I you know, tried to pay attention to the conversations. And it, the conversations aren't all that different. Um, anyway, um, I was you know, missing Vermont. But this is, you know, uh, March and April in Vermont is, is still white, still trees, you know, brown trees. But in, in California, I'm thinking, I'm missing green Vermont, I'm missing trees. You know, my brain had not gotten to winter there. So there's a cemetery just around the corner. And um, it's a very old cemetery, like from 1850, and it had all these big, majestic trees in it. And of course, I'm going, hey, let's have a picnic in the cemetery. And I asked all my <laughs> friends, oh, yes, yes, let's do this. So that's Katie. She's from Alaska. Dawn is from Florida, and Jeanette, I'm not, I can't remember where she's from. We were the only four that could actually pull it together, and so we, we, we go to the, 
the, sh the kitchen door of the chef, and we bang, 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 and I'm like, can I have some containers so we can go have a picnic? And he says, sure, he hands us the containers. We go to the dining hall, we fill them up, we're going, can we take forks out of the center? <laughs> we did, but we went and we had a, had a picture, and some passerby took a picture of us, because, you know, I mean, maybe eating, having a picnic in a cemetery is odd, but when you haven't eaten for like ever, <laughs> you know, this was pretty fun. So anyway, we also took a lot of walks around Santa Rosa. And these are, obviously, this is an affluent neighborhood. The lawns, I mean, the, the lemon trees and the other fruiting trees and the roses. I could not believe how many roses. I mean, the long stemmed ones, all kinds of roses. Just, just beautiful lawns. And we even branched out to not so affluent housing, and even their lawns had so many things in them. They just didn't grow just grass, and we even came across a couple places that was fake grass. But you have to, you have to really look, wait, is that real? You, you don't want to speak. <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, so we did a lot of walking, but when you're at the center, they, they, when they introduce you, they show you all the doors, and here's all the codes, and when you're water fasting, please don't leave. But you're not locked in. And the chef is fond of saying, you know, as prisoners of the asylum. Um, uh, but, you know, it, 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 um, it was pretty cool when I got to eat and I could start walking with my friends. So going forward, I need to, to do things that are going to encourage me to stay with this. Because I'm, I, I, my first anniversary of this, this type of lifestyle comes up on November 1st. So um, my bucket list, these are, this is a new bucket list, by the way, since coming home. I want a health span that's long, as long as my lifespan, if that makes sense. I want to live, I want to be healthy until I'm dead. I don't want to spend debilitating years in, in nursing homes and things like that. And that is exactly where I was headed with 235 pounds, and, and diabetes and everything, I didn't see, I could, you know, past, 50, past 70 wasn't going to happen for me. So now I can actually see my way to 100. I'm taking Pilates and Hardwick, and this November I'm going to add weightlifting because I want to be strong, and especially if I want to climb, you know, Mount Pisgah, I think I can do. I want to do that this fall, end of September, mid-October. Mid Anybody want to go hiking? There's Andy. Um, I, I, I want to climb that this fall. I want to water ski again next summer. I hate water skiing. I learned to do it. But now that I'm healthy, thin, and strong, I'm going to do it again, maybe once. Um, I'm a flatlander. I don't like cold water. I want to climb the precipice again as a thin and strong person. So I'm, I'm scheduling that for the fall of next, next year. I have to wait for the peregrine falcons to do their mating and raising of their young, because they close the cliffs down when they're doing that. So I have to make sure I get there. Now this, this last thing here, I want to climb Mount Roraima, which is situated the junction of Venezuela, Brazil, and Guyana. And that's the trail up it. And that's probably not something I'm ever going to do, but it's on my list because I want to do it primarily because I think I can do it. So I'm going to close and read something to you. Now, I have a paper here with a bunch of links to, to the True North Health Center and a lot of research articles. and. Um, I also, there's also a link on there to Chef Bravo's website, to Chef AJ's website, and to the blog, because I blogged this for family and friends who wanted, you know, they wanted to know what was going on with me, and I didn't want to answer 40 emails, so I blogged every day for 49 days, and you can go and read that if you so chose. Do you need the lights on now? Oh, yeah, you can turn the lights on now, because that's the last slide. So I'm going to read something to you here as I close. So um, Dr. Hammer, Dr. Goldhammer was being interviewed, and someone said, and this is the journal that nobody gets to see, so you get to hear some of what I wrote in it. Um, so is this bar too high, this diet, this, this, this lifestyle, too high? And Dr. Goldhammer says, and I'm paraphrasing because I needed to condense his, his answer, absolutely it's too high, except for those who want to get healthy, and overcome chronic disease and live fully functional and healthy lives. I think the best chance of that happening would be to adopt a whole food, plant-based, SOS-free diet, engage in regular exercise, get enough sleep, and when appropriate, intermittent, intermittent fasting every day and occasionally a long-term fast. We've never pretended that this was an approach that would be amenable for everybody 
or popular or easy. It's not. But for the people that need it, it's the best we have come up with so far. And this meant something to me because this is what I needed. It's not for everybody. I'm not preaching it. It's not, there's no, no conversion here whatsoever needed. But it was something that, that I had to do. So this change process is ever-evolving. I need tools in my life, not just solid tools like a hammer, but psychological ones too. These are not so quantifiable. I came to True North having already watched hundreds of hours of videos of all the major players in the whole plant-based movement, hundreds of hours of others who live this way. I came to True North for seven reasons. To reverse diabetes, cholesterol, and high blood pressure. To invoke autophagy to heal my body. To lose weight to learn how to do it, and to learn from Chef Bravo. I have been a home cook for 45 years. I cook from scratch most of the time, dinner on the table every evening. It was mostly healthy, but not to the level of true north. I know how to cook and all, have all the tools to do it, but this is not enough. I need to see how this is done. I have a lot of recipes, but it is about how you cook it and how you put it together. So many are caught in the pleasure trap and can't see a way out. As many recover alcoholics will say, you first have to get out to see your way forward. I have found my way out and my way forward and fasting helped me to see it. Not everyone can fast or ever will want to, but I'm grateful to have found True North and was able to do this. Now to go home and complete the change and complete it I will. Thank you. So, if anybody has questions, I you know. I have a question. Oh, yes. The uh, salt, oil, and sugar, uh, why does he say no meat? I mean, why, why is that? What, is there something in the meat that uh, is? Yes and yes. Right. Um, uh, I'll do the easy part first um, because, I mean, Dr. Goldhammer is a vegan. He hasn't had meat since he was 16. He's been a vegan since he's 16. And, and they, there are those that say, you know, we're going to heal the planet by not eating meat. And that may be true. I don't know. I'm, I'm not morally opposed to eating meat. I am opposed to the feedlots. I mean, they're, they're, I mean all these cows, there's just no grass. It, you know, I, the cow that sits in my freezer right now, which I'm not going to be eating, I have to give it to the kids, uh, um, grew five miles from my house on a green field and cared for and, and, and ate, drank rain water. Okay, so, so there's, there's a huge difference in those two things. And what Dr. Goldhammer, I, I like the way he puts this, even though he doesn't eat meat for these reasons. He says, you know, we're trying to cure the planet. What about curing the people? And that's what he's about with this health center, is about curing the people. And um, I don't know if that helps, but yeah, that, that, that vegan uh, ideology versus, I mean, I'm doing this purely for health. It's not ideological for me whatsoever. It's I'm I'm sick and I and this is what I have to do, and I don't like cruelty. So, yes. Did you feel cold when you were doing that fast? Yes, there were times when I did feel cold. Because you, you know, I do this for a day or two days at a time, and I'm freezing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Sometimes I, I did feel cold. Um, the, my little cave had a, a heater, and I ran it a lot um, while I was fasting. Once I started feeding, I ran it less and less. But yeah, you can get cold. Um, during the time you were fasting on just water, um, what did you do during the day and when you couldn't sleep at night? I'm assuming you probably couldn't read because you couldn't concentrate. You couldn't go for walks. Like, what would you do all day? Yeah, the and night. <laughs> <laughs> At night, you spent your time trying to yeah. sleep. <laughs> I would watch movies or listen to podcasts. Um, uh, I brought a uh, crocheting with me. I brought a pattern that I have made. I made this pineapple doily. It gets to be about this big a dozen times. And I'm sitting there on the couch in the common room, and I'm going, a double, triple crochet. I know this. How does that work again? And I'm trying to make my hands do what I know I know how to do. And so the doily is now unfinished. And I may just end it where it is and frame it as a true north memento because, because I mean, yeah, you, 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 you do run into you know, things to do. There's puzzles, games. You visit with people in the courtyard. There are demos and there are lectures that you can go to. 
a lot of people will make use of going to the chiropractor, going to the massage facial person. Um, I did that once. It's just not, not necessarily my, my thing, but some people did it like twice a week. So, so there are th things like that. But yeah, reading, is it, it was hard um, sometimes. Yeah. I, so that's why I switched to podcasts and books that were read to me. But, can yeah. I ask another one? Yes, you can. <laughs> okay. uh, if you, I know sometimes when I have had access to food and I get real hungry, that's all I think about. So when you're fasting, did that become a problem for you? Um, no, I didn't think constantly about food. Um, I, I tend to be utilitarian when it comes to food, so if I need to eat two pounds of broccoli, I can eat two pounds of broccoli. So I don't really think about food. Um, some people do. Some people don't make it through the first day and they're done. And, and it's just different. That's why I think, <laughs> yeah, Tom, <laughs> I, people, I think personality can play into that. Um, in, Is there in, like an initial hump where you're... you're yeah, well, that first day when you're burning through all the food yeah. and everything, and then you, once you get into it, it's a little easier. Yeah, yeah. After after the third day, it is a little easier mm -hmm. uh, because you, you you're right. You you have to get past that point where your body switches from glucose to ketones, and then things are different. Doesn't mean you're no longer hungry, but no, I, I didn't I didn't dream about food. I think about food. I I went to the cooking demos. Um, I think I took that video fasted. Um, of the, of the kitchen. So I, I don't mind being around food and fasting. It doesn't bother me so much. I think it bothers some others, but most of us went to all the cooking demos. You could at least <laughs> smell the food. <laughs> so, um, but, so you didn't want to eat eventually? Or I mean, did you get to a point where you thought, I, I don't need food? I no. Don't eat no. Or... no, I was hungry every day. No, no, you, you look forward to that day when you can start your, you know, okay. your, your refeed. You do. So is the um, is the pattern similar then for everyone? If you yeah day no, yeah you 10, don't day twenty day whatever. Well, the first three days is typical for everyone. Okay. And then just how long you can stand it, which I think okay. I think it's more about psychology than it is about the food. I mean, even now, um, I remember how delicious a bag of potato chips are. Okay, I mean. That's just, that's why they're made that way. And I have that memory of enjoying those foods. Mm -hmm. But I don't think about them now because the addiction's been broken. I don't want to eat them. I can be around people who are eating them. I know there's a, our, my sister Arlene, we were somewhere and she had something. I said, can I smell it? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, sure, whatever, brother, you can smell it. And I think it was Fritos, the bag of Frito chips. Mm -hmm. and, she, and I smelled it. And I'm going, ew, mm -hmm. that's a chemically burnt smell. And I used to love that. Mm -hmm. So, so, so some, some of these foods have changed. But I think, I think for the most part, I mean, you're looking for a dopamine hit too, just probably not to the level I took it. And that may be why you just, you're driven. I mean, you think about it, you know, this doctor with the evolutionary model, if you don't eat, you die. You don't live to reproduce and pass on your genes. So we're driven to eat and we need to eat. And I don't think that ever goes away Un unless you've fasted so long, you're now in starvation. And it's, I, I mean, I've never done it that, that far, but that would be interesting to ask someone who has gone that far. So you're on maintenance now, and you will just do this on your own yes. pretty much? Yes, yes, yes. And see so your doctor um, in Plainfield. And... Yep, yep. I, I see the doctor in Plainfield. I see the naturopath. I use the naturopath to help me with supplements if I need some supplements. And we run some blood tests to see what's, you know, because I just don't want to take supplements just because. And I'm, I'm not taking any prescription drugs now anyway. So it's just a few supplements here. And I'm like, okay, so I have to take B12 because you can only get B12 from animal products. And so I, I do, I, I actually I'm doing injections right now. I inject myself once a week in the thigh with some B12. Um, I take zinc, vitamin D3, and K2. Um, methylfolate, because I know my genes have trouble processing folate into methylfolate, so I just take methylfolate. Um, um, what else is there? I can't remember right now, but a handful of them. Yes. Are you allowed to eat nutritional yeast? 
yes, I am. <laughs> Dr. Goldhammer doesn't like it because it is not, it's not a whole food. You're trying, yeah, the nutrition. Um, I think a whole, it's made, it, it, it's sort of a, it's, it's a fungus that grows, so it's like maybe it's a whole food. And he doesn't really care for it, so it's not allowed in the center. But I know like Chef AJ and some of the other plant-based people, like I think Kathy Fisher, they do use it, and I do use it occasionally. Um, you know, I'm, when you want something cheesy, I don't know how nutritional yeast makes something taste like cheese, because I remember what cheese tastes like, and that's not how it tastes. <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, I have used it a time or two. I mean, when you take tofu, and that's something that they don't use at the center, but that I do use a little bit of. Um, not very often, but when you take tofu, and you like you take really thin tofu called silken, or, Thin, and you take the really, really hard one and you, you put some nutritional yeast and some onion powder or something in it, and then you crumble up the, the hard um, tofu and you mix it in. It looks like cottage cheese. Now, don't expect it to taste like cottage cheese, but when you put it on a potato, it serves the purpose the cottage cheese would, and I find it tasty. Now, I don't eat it very often. I would prefer to put on a vegetable chili or some beans. Because that's the one thing I, I do need to be careful about is, is, is making sure I'm eating a balanced diet. And one thing I'll mention here, something about, you know, most fasting patients, oh, let me back up. Fasting is stressful for the body, especially if you're doing extended water fasts. They're stressful. And pregnancy can be stressful. And there's such a thing as hair fall. Your hair falls out. So I know you can't tell by looking at me, but I probably have lost a third of my hair because of this. I'm no longer losing it. The hairdresser says, oh no, it's growing back out. It's all over the place. So, so it's just the stress of that. So you know, I, when, when I started with the hair falling out, you know, I wanted to make sure I got my amino acids and I got my, my, you know, my protein. And so for, for breakfast, I take half a banana and I chop it up in the bottom of the bowl, I grate some cinnamon over it and I microwave it for one minute. That's because the banana melts and it's sweeter. And then I put in a cup of oatmeal and I put in a cup of soy milk, the high protein one, and I, I microwave it. I don't mess with the pot on the stove. Then I put in a tablespoon of ground sunflower seeds, a tablespoon of ground flax seed after it's cooked. I don't cook those. I stir that in. And about a half a cup or a cup of frozen uh, blueberries. And that's my bread. I love that. And that bowl provides me with all of the essential amino acids and all the others. It's, it, it's, it's not as, maybe it's not as potent as eating a hamburger or eight ounce of steak, but it provides me with 20 30 to 30 grams of protein. And your body can only really process 20 to 30 milligrams or grams of protein which is it? Grams. grams of, of protein at a time so there's no point in eating 80 grams of protein because your body's not going to process enough of it, you need to break it up that's why you get your weightlifters who eat 7 and 8 and 10 times a day, they, they're hammering and the gene they're hammering is called mTOR and mTOR was what triggers you to grow muscle so they're, they're hammering it periodically through the day with the right amount of protein and all the essential amino acids so that they can get bigger. And, and so, and I think getting back to your meat question, that's probably one, one of the things about eating meat and eating a lot of it and eating it often is you're constantly hammering mTOR. And mTOR is like an, an, is, is like an aging gene. It's going to age you. And what you want is the opposite of mTOR, which is fasting. So that's why intermittent fasting, I think, is supposed to work is because, let's just say, 12 hours a day I'm eating protein, hammering mTOR, but the other 12 I'm fasting, so autophagy occurs, and the sirtuins, another set of genes, the sirtuins kick in, and they are the longevity genes. And so you want that, that balance, and that's why that intermittent fasting thing is such a fad, is because the longevity, I want to live forever movement has figured some of this stuff out. So that's another reason why I don't want to hammer my mTOR and eat a lot of meat. And you know, people tend to eat meat maybe two or three times a day. Um, maybe I'll get to the place where I have to have something once a month. I don't know. Dr. Goldhammer would say, you never need meat. Just, you know, I'm like, and that may be true as long as I eat right. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, yeah, 
Living to 111, okay, it's fun to talk about, but I don't know that I want to outlive my children because I don't foresee them adopting my diet to outlive me. So, so, um, but, but, yeah. I have another question, but I don't want to take up anybody else's time. So, yeah. Go, go ahead, Tom. No, that, a, anyone? I know Danielle's trying to. Well, yes. I, that one. I, I, I'm. There are a couple of points that, you know, maybe to talk about this, the safety of this. So, as much as you, you know, my mom's like, I want to go do this fasting thing, and I'm like, okay. Well, I know that water fast, if you don't do them correctly, can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And if you're on medication, getting off your medication, that can be dangerous too. Like when you first became diabetic, like that three month where it went, it went up to over like 13, and you're like, I don't want to take insulin. I'm like, I agree with you. However, I was getting nervous that you were going to be alone somewhere and go into a diabetic coma. And <laughs> I'm like, sure, long term, you don't want to be on insulin. That's great. So let's let's solve this problem. But in the short term, if that were to happen, that's not that's 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 very risky. So, um, you know, I went with you to clinic to support you and to just kind of check it out, talk to your doctors, and make sure I wasn't leaving you with people who were going to kill you. <laughs> um, but, you know, like you talked about, you're not allowed to leave the scent while you're allowed. There's a sign-out sheet, and that's a safety concern. Like, if you're out, you get lightheaded, you hit your head. If you don't sign back in, they know to go find you. Yep. And things like... They're monitoring you. They do rounds twice a day because if they're you know, making sure you're okay, they're checking your vitals, and they can safely get you off your medications. It's another reason why I wanted you to be in a clinic, watched by a doctor, not trying this at home, which can be dangerous. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what your thoughts were on this, like the safety, um, the safety component of doing this and doing it correctly. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, this is my daughter, Danielle, who went to California with me to make sure I wasn't being dropped off in a cult. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> I did lock you up when I left. That's, That's true. true. We have a video of her locking me in there. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this was medically supervised, and it's one of the reasons that I went. I think it's one of the reasons why Dr. Matthew was okay with it, because it is a medically supervised water-only fasting, and they will tell you if you're going to fast, I think they say... If you're going to do anything over three to five days, you should be in a clinic setting, clinical setting and be monitored because um, especially if you're on medications and, and what they do is they want you off of medications. They don't want to fast people who are on any kind of medications because they don't know how the medications will react with the fast. So there's some people they can't fast. They will come and just eat the diet or do a juice fast or something. Um, but they're, they're, very, they're very focused on the medical aspect of this because they want people safe. And as Dr. Goldhammer says, 21,000 people walked in and 21,000 walked out. Nobody's died yet. None of you better mess up my friend. <laughs> um, so, so, so yeah, it, they're, they're very serious about the medical aspects of this. And as time, I mean, California's tried to shut them down multiple times over the decades. And, and fasting is really becoming a thing out there. And people, oh, just not, just not eat for three days. And I cringe, you know. I, I've, done, I've done a 48-hour fast on my own. And I think you could probably, you know, if you're healthy, you probably could. I, I'm just not going to say. You could probably do more days, but that's up to people. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, yeah, about, you know, the fasting. It, take me, it took me like 14 to 17 hours to get to this center. That's a grueling day on a plane, two planes and, and, and taxis and whatever else is in between. And so Dr. Goldhammer wants to, he's got this body of, of data from all of these patients. And he collects our blood and he does freeze it so they can retest it later when they learn more. And it's a research facility which makes it you know another level higher than just not going to some I don't know, house in the woods and fasting. Um, the, he wants, he call, I think it's called the navigator study. I think I'll, I'm part of it now. And he wants to track people. And, and because the facility is only so big and they're trying to, to get more capacity and they've purchased houses around where they have more rooms, um, he's trying to get pop-up clinics around the country I think the country, I don't know about the world, maybe, because people from other countries travel to California to do this. Um, so people like me, I'm maintenance, I'm healthy. He actually says that when someone who's healthy now fasts, there's even more benefits that they can get. Because first your body's busy healing and fixing itself. 
Now it's doing prevention when you fast. So I want to do 10 days of fasting a year, and I don't want to go to California. So I'm trying to find a doctor, either in Burlington or New Hampshire, who will sponsor a pop-up clinic, and that will work by, for two weeks a year, it will pop up. I will go to the hotel, wherever that is. The, the, the True North Health Center will set the whole thing up for the doctor in Vermont. I will do my 10 days, I will do my five days of refeed, and I can come home and you know, not have to go to California. Because I, I just, it, to me, it's too far away. I'm too disconnected from family and friends. I don't know why. A hotel room in Burlington would be better. But, but um, maybe just the idea of knowing I'm close to home. So, but, but even that is in a medical, medically supervised setting because they would send a doctor up to monitor so that, and they, so that they can collect the data for this study. And, and you know, I'm going, well, that's pretty cool. I don't have to travel. So if that got to the, the point, yeah, yeah but by no means am I suggesting that you just start fasting and not do so. You, you need medical supervision if you're going to do it for more than intermittent fasting. Because people ask Dr. Goldhammer that question all the time, well, should everyone fast? And he says, absolutely, every day, 12 hours, 12 to 16 hours, and half of that you're asleep. So, um, yeah, everyone fasts. It's just and why, that's why they call it breakfast. <laughs> so, yeah, breakfast. breakfast. <laughs> yes. Out of curiosity, since um, nobody's died in all the time, and it seems it's pretty strict medical, mm -hmm. why does California want to close it down? Because it's an outside of the box medical treat medical treatment. I, um, they, they're doing studies now that they show that fasting does better with your high blood pressure than the pills will. And the pills have their own downsides. And the pills can kill people too. And, and they're, they're, they've got a couple of studies, and the link is to the studies. You can look them up on hypertension, um, where they're better at managing blood pressure than pills. And, and, and so, um, what's the other one I wanted to mention? Um, repeat your question. You were asking why what, they want to shut them down. Well, why they want to shut them down. Well, if, if we all of a sudden get, uh, I got well, okay. So how much, I was taking three or four different medications. Just how much money do you think the pharmaceutical industry is now not going to get if I stick to this? And if we suddenly, this caught on like wildfire and everybody was doing it, then nobody's going to need to pay, you know, some of my pills were three and $400 a month. I had health insurance, thank God. But, you know, that the diabetes medication is expensive. And so, um, and it, it's just like quackery is what they were called in the beginning. But now they're, it, the, the, the idea of fasting is growing. True North is able to do its own clinical research. It's really hard to get the big medical journals to pay attention to something that they do. So they're, they're working on that. I just heard him say the Mayo Clinic has given them a grant to do something. A professor from Southern, a, a, a different situation, but a professor from Southern University wants to work with them to do some fasting something, because he does fasting other things. Longevity research is Dr. Walter Longo, Southern California University. So, so, so if they're just beginning to, to get somewhere. But that's why, because it's, it's too weird. I mean, you can't just not feed people. I mean. Back at the turn of the previous century, the 1900s, I guess, um, you know, it's like you, you, you can't fast past two days, you'll die. Now, there is a documented case of a man in England who fasted, water fasted, for a year. And he started, he was 600 or five or 600 pounds, so he had the, the resources on board to support a year-long water fast. And he lost all the way down to like 195. He only gained 15 back. He's still thin. So I mean, I just can't fathom the, the mental aspect. I think he did take some vitamins and some electrolytes through that process. But so, so we know the human body can go a long time without food before it starts eating itself, which is when it starts eating its muscles, then you're starving. This man was not starving. He was fasting. And we, we throw that word starving around too lightly these days. But, okay. but that's, that's why they, it's just so outside the standard of care. And I don't know that it'll ever be brought in because it, you don't make money having people drink water. It just surprises me that it's California because I've oh, yeah. lived there for a few years. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, they do a lot of weird things. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just surprised that California would. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, no, they, they operated all through COVID. They had patients who opted to just stay there. Um, and there are wildfires out there. They operated through that. They almost thought they had to evacuate. But when you've got someone who's not eaten for 28 days, then you just don't pick them up and, you know, you, you've got to prep them somehow. So they were, they were really watching those fires. They got quite close, but they didn't, not close enough to close, so. I have a statement, not so much a question, yes. but I, you know, I feel like in my experiences with the medical profession, that they're not used to having people, telling people to be uncomfortable in any way. You know, I, I tell my doctor, you know, I get headaches and these are the 10 different foods that give me headaches and I have to avoid those foods or else I get headaches. And she said, you shouldn't have to avoid those foods. You should, you know, take some headache, headache medication and you won't have, or take some vitamins or... It's always the taking something mm -hmm. and yes. the subtracting of things is not usually discussed. Correct, correct. Yeah, it's a... It's, unnerving where, where, where the medical community came from and is now at. I mean, when I was in Acadia, when I climbed the precipice, I was in some museum place and I was reading something about J.D. Rockefeller and he thought it was a really good idea to get into the pharmaceutical industry because you can get people on subscription month after month after month after month. And back at that time there was natural medicine, naturopathic, homeopathic, and, and I think there may be a swing back to that, you know, pendulums do this. And, and I don't think we can discount either side of that because modern medicine has some tremendous advantages, especially in an ER. And they're just amazing how they can save lives. And, you know, and surgeries and things like that. So, you know, I still, we still want and need that, but we, we, we need this in, Integrative medicine. We, we need to integrate some of these natural self-healing. We can heal ourselves. I mean, your health depends on what you put in your mouth, plain and simple. And and it doesn't matter what diet you're on or what you know what what modality you want. It's okay. <laughs> um, but 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 that, that that gets down to you've got to get the body the right kind of fuel so it can heal itself. And people at True North are living proof that if you get out of the body's way, it will fix itself. Now, does it fix everything? No. Fasting doesn't do much for neurological diseases. Autoimmune diseases, however, fasting works beautifully because it reduces inflammation just because you're fasting. And then if you go on this diet, which is anti-inflammatory, you can actually maintain some gains and, and not have an autoimmune disease be so destructive for you. It may not go away, doesn't cure it. Uh, my diabetes aren't cured. Um, so they're just in remission. As long as I keep them there, I'm fine. So, so yeah, I would like to see you know some 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 mixing. I have um, recently. I know some of you know the story. I stepped on glass, and the the the, the PA and the um, express care couldn't get out. The PA and the, the ER couldn't get it out. The podiatrist couldn't get it out in his office. Here I am three weeks with this piece of glass in my foot and I have to end up in the surgery, in the OR, because the, the, P, the, the podiatrist had tools in the OR he could use that weren't in his office. And, and so, you know, I, I, I have this connection now and then I have this connection with Danielle's Dr. Fenton. He does platelet-rich plasma therapy, which is something the center out here is aware of and, and knows works. It's where they draw your blood, they spin it out, and they take the white blood cells and they inject them back into, say, a joint or a ligaments that are torn and it, it invokes or calls in those healing aspects of your body to come to that joint and to heal or tighten up that ligament. And it actually works. And I've experienced it. Danielle's experienced it. Well, now I am hoping to do some of this integrative medicine because I have, oh, that helix whatever toe you have bone impingement on your big toe and your big toe hurts and there's arthritis and all this and that. So I'm going to have the bone, um, I'm going to have the joint cleaned out in my big right toe. So that requires modern medicine, a surgeon, and an OR. The same guy who took out the glass. And I'm going to have, he's agreed to work with Dr. Fenton who works outside of the box because within 10 days of the surgery, uh, there, he's going to inject some of my bone marrow into the joint and put the healing factors right there so what's left of the cartilage in that 
toe joint will fill in. It won't thicken it and doesn't regrow it, but it helps to fill in the holes so that I can actually survive these other 50 years Dr. Goldhammer has given me. <laughs> I need feet that work if I'm actually going to live that long, and that's why I'm going to do this. But my whole point is, is that it, it, it's that integrative into uh, the, the medicine that's outside the box that does work with modern medicine, which does work, and I'm hoping to mix them together to make my feet feel better so that I can climb Mount Roraima in Brazil. That's kind of where I'm going with that. And uh, I think that, yeah, let's take some stuff away. Let's eat less, yeah. you know? I think it's a, a cultural switch a yep. little bit to think that maybe I'm not going to be comfortable all the time. Yeah. You yep. know, I think that there has been a, a maybe sort of a false setup for people to, to think that I, I'm supposed to be comfortable and I'm supposed to like everything I'm yep. eating. Like, I, I don't, I wouldn't eat that because I don't like it. Well, you eat it because you need your two pounds of broccoli, right? <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, it's a, it's, I have run into a couple of situations where I've had to actually not eat. It seems like when I came home, my family and friends saved all of the events for when I got home. <laughs> I was in California. They did there nothing. Were huh? There were meetings. Oh, there were meetings. Yeah, you guys yeah. planned this. <laughs> you know, and I come home, and it's like four funerals and five baby showers and fundraisers and family picnics and all this and that. And if, if I get caught and I'm like, ooh, I didn't realize there was food, I brought my own food to all of them, including funerals and, um, and fundraisers. I, the, the caterers looked at me odd, but I asked for permission from the person who, skipped, who, who set up the fundraiser. No, um, if I get into a situation where, oops, I can't, you know, I don't have food and I, there's nothing I can eat, I fast. Just for those few hours, I'm not going to die. I did 28 days. Six hours is going to be just fine till I get home to my potatoes. I can do that. So, so you know, that's, that's the kind of process I've had to change because before I would just scarf it in, you know, and you're not going to miss that stuff. Oh, I love that potluck stuff. But, but now I, I think differently and it's exactly that, I, you know, I can do without to like home. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you very, thank you very much. much.